2.05. And I think with that, we can start. So hello, everyone, and hello. welcome to the Activism in Politics panel. Um, I first want to thank Rachel Whitwick and Lexi for organizing this event today and who will be joining us as panelists, introducing themselves soon. Um, but I'm Matea Basterna, pronouns he, him, his, and in HSDA, I am one of your diversity directors as well as the Black Caucus Vice Chairman. And quickly, I want to say how I got involved in HSDA and how my story kind of in intersects with activism before going through, of course, the objectives and goals that this discussion will not only address, but um, inspire. In my freshman year of high school, um, it all starts there. I joined a local chapter of HSDA in Downingtown, Pennsylvania. And let me tell you, the most impactful work that gets done in this organization is on the local level. Like, don't let anyone tell you differently. But nonetheless, um, what we did in our state chat in our school chapter was using the resources we had at, we had at hand, um, using our passion to advocate for the issues most pressing, and allocating the little time we had as students to balance schoolwork and making change. Um, that year in my local chapter was a year of phone banking during literally almost every lunch period. Um, it was organizing, attending, and speaking at our district's um, March for Our Lives protest. And it was rallying our school's administration to hold a voter registration drive, um, of which we were successful and we registered 70% of all eligible students in our um, district, which is amazing. And although the work we did on the local level is literally it's a fraction of what activists dedicate their lives to. It is still the work that inspires us and literally millions around the world to act using vigorous campaigning to bring around social and political change, which of course is the Google definition of activism. With that said, um, it would be wrong for me to not address what inspired this panel. Um, in HSDA, there has been rightful criticism surrounding our lack of involvement in grassroots activism. Um, this panel will highlight of political organizers and stress the importance of pressuring elected officials to represent youth, youth issues. Um, panelists will stress the importance of the cause they organize for, um, discuss events that they've organized and recommend strategies for you, the members and leaders in HSDA. Um, this will also foster grassroots activism in our organization hopefully absolving the cloutivism, may I say, or work of, workaholic behavior. Um, our goal with this discussion is to not only educate, but inspire. Um, how do you organize outside of electoral politics on issues like climate justice, gun violence, prevention, um, women's rights, and more, all issues that affect our generation the most. And right now, have to join or continue being at the front lines calling for action. Um, panelists will also educate on ways we can uplift those causes and their organizations. We really hope that every single one of you will be able to use this knowledge to promote social justice causes in your state and local chapters. Um, on our panel, we'll be hearing from members of the New Jersey High School Democrats, as well as various other leaders in democratically oriented organizations. With that, I want to allow our amazing panelists to introduce themselves with their name, name, pronouns, of course, age, organization, and how they got involved with their respective organizations. So first off, starting with um, Rachel Gervich. Hey, everyone. Um, as Mateo said, I'm Rachel Gervich. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm 16 years old. Um, so in HSDA, some of you may know me as the chair of New Jersey and vice chair of the Jewish caucus. Um, but today I'm going to be talking to you about an organization I lead called New Jersey Youth for Climate Action, um, which is formerly known as New Jersey Youth Climate Strike. Um, so like many environmentalists, I first became involved in climate activism during the wave of climate strikes spearheaded by Greta Thunberg, organizing a strike myself in Morristown, New Jersey, when I was just 14. Um, however, my reasoning for climate action has transformed a lot in the past year, becoming more focused on environmental justice. Though we all know the pressing nature of the climate crisis, oftentimes we forget the intersectionality of climate issues. Um, one pivotal moment for me was this January while I was delivering care packages to homeless people in New York along with my synagogue. I began talking to one man about how he wound up in his situation. He was visibly in pain and told me that he was injured while he was injured at work 
He was unable to afford health care and lost his job, his home, and then everything else. As the climate crisis progresses, BIPOC communities are becoming increasingly vulnerable. The issues of healthcare inequality has been especially apparent during COVID-19 as black, brown, and indigenous people whose communities are located near pollutant sites are dying at disproportionate rates. With that, I'm truly looking forward to telling you a bit more about my experience with grassroots activism and hopefully I'll inspire you to get involved. Um, so I'll pass it back over to Mateo um, to let our next panelists introduce themselves. Thank you, Rachel. Next up, we have Ritwik Tati. Hey guys, um, I'm Ritwik, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I'm 16 years old, and in HSDA, I'm the vice chair of New Jersey High School Democrats. Um, that's mainly representing a youth climate action team, or YCAT. Um, formerly known as Wisconsin Youth Climate Strike. So I actually got involved with YCAT as an organization pretty recently. Um, I was already doing a lot of climate organizing with uh, Sunrise Movement and then with U.S. Youth Climate Strike later. And one thing that really attracted me to YCAT was their theory of change um, and exactly why they decided to be another national climate organization in the midst of so many that already exist. Um, I thought that their vision was really clear and focused, and the organizers within YCAT are some of the most amazing people that I've met. Um, for that reason, I decided to stay with YCAT, and I currently serve as their national press co-secretary. Um, yeah, I'm going to pass it over to Mateo. Thank you so much, um, Ritwick. Next up we have is Lexi Abrams. Thanks, Mateo. Hi, everyone. My name is Lexi Abrams. Um, within HSCA, I am membership director um, for New Jersey High School Democrats. Um, but today I'm going to be talking um, based on my um, role in Generation Ratify. Um, so just to give a little background, Generation Ratify is a youth-led movement to ratify the ERA and to advance, advance gender um, equality. Um, so just a little bit about how I got involved in the organization. Um, so it was actually through High School Democrats. Um, we were talking, last year I was political director, um, so we were talking about a partnership with Generation Ratify, and um, I saw that they had applications open, and I was very interested, um, especially because as, uh, as a woman, I've um, had to deal with gender inequality a lot throughout my life. Um, and then one thing about Generation Ratify that really drew me to it um, was that it's completely youth-led. There's no one like um, over 25 that's involved with, organ with the organization, like in a leadership role that's not like an adult advisor or anything. Um, and I just love that type of organization because it made me feel like um, I could do so much more. And then I also wouldn't be like looked down upon as like less than because of my age. Um, so that was basically how I got started in Generation Ratify. Um, and I, um, my position in Generation Ratify, I didn't say that before. Um, I am one of the co-state leads for New Jersey. So um, I've just been organizing within New Jersey and also um, working in tandem with people on the national level. And I will give it back to Mateo. Thank you, Lexi. And then next up we have, sorry if I mispronounce any names, but Nidhi Krishnan. Yeah, you got that right. Um, hey everyone, my name is Nidhi Krishnan. I use she, her pronouns and I'm going to be speaking on, um, well, I, I, I'm going to be speaking on half of um, Students Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. I am an alum of High School Democrats of America. I'm originally from Bloomington, Indiana, where I helped lead um, the Indiana uh, High School Democrats chapter. And I also had a local chapter, um, but I'm currently a rising sophomore at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, so yeah, I, I got involved with Students Demand Action. Um, I grew up in a pretty white affluent town and my uh, impetus to get involved with Students Demand Action was I was worried about mass shootings. Um, but as I've continued my work in gun violence prevention, I have um, come to realize that mass shootings make up less than 1% of gun related deaths and injuries. And um, the reason that the news media and um, our elected officials in power focus a lot on mass shootings is because of the demographic that um, mass shootings target, which is more affluent white communities rather than the everyday gun violence that happens in communities of color. Um, and living in St. Louis, I've grown very passionate about getting involved at the local level um, and especially interrogating the, the connections between gun violence and systemic racism. So 
Um, that's a little bit about me and I will pass it back to Mateo. Thank you. And then next we have Carly Young. Hi everyone, my name is Carly Young. Um, I use she, her pronouns and I'm 16. Um, I am with the organization Period. Um, I first started this as, I'm part of student government and we were just looking to put period products in the, our bathrooms, our school bathrooms. Um, and we found an organization that was more, that was more deeply rooted into the problems that um, menstruators face, such as period poverty, which is when people cannot afford buying period products because they have to either pay for rent or buy food, and also just destigmatizing menstruation in general, since there is so much taboo around this topic. So along with my partner Adi, um, we started a chapter of the period organization at our school and we basically run it as a school club and we've been the work that we've been doing is to, we've been starting to um, raise awareness around the tampon tax in Michigan and to and to repeal the tax in Michigan and we've also done donations around um, in our own community in Wayne and Washtenaw counties. Um, and I can give it back to Mateo. Thank you. And last but not least, Emma Codiverdine. Yeah, you got it. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Emma Codiverdine. I'm 17. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm here representing the Sunrise Movement, which is a grassroots climate movement slash activism organization working for a Green New Deal. And I initially got involved for different reasons than most. I initially wasn't too passionate about environmental concerns specifically, um, but I knew that BIPOC groups, especially indigenous people and black folks were being disproportionately, disproportionately affected by um, climate change. And we weren't really seeing a lot of indigenous folks and other BIPOC groups in leadership and kind of leading the efforts in different activism movements. So I really wanted to see how kind of having those people not only having their concerns amplified, but being able to lead the effort. So initially I got involved with um, a strike circle, which is basically a small caucus at um, different schools and um, working kind of to recruit people to go strike on Earth Day. And then obviously that was der derailed due to COVID. And then from there, I got involved with um, the Los Angeles chapter. And then I got involved with some folks that were starting a youth chapter in Los Angeles. And now I'm the hub coordinator for Sunrise LA Youth. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think we have some amazing panelists here. And this is a panel, so we are going to jump right into questions. So we have enough time for everyone to answer, um, answer them. So this first question is going to be, why should people care about the cause that you're advocating for? Um, I'm gonna direct this question to Lexi. Yeah, so um, again, I'm Lexi um, I'm a, and I'm with Generation Ratify. Um, so the reason why people should care about um, gender inequality is obviously there's so many different reasons, um, but especially for me as a woman, um, it's really something that I'm passionate about. Um, I mean, I see all the time in the news and I'm sure many people um, are with me on this. You see like women make 83 cents um, for every dollar that a man makes. Then we've seen things with the women's soccer team and how they haven't been getting the amount of pay that they should be getting based on like um, the amount of times they've won and like um, based on their um, salaries um, compared to the men's salaries. Um, and then recently we've also seen, you know, Betsy DeVos rolling back um, Title IX um, help um, for um, sexual assault survivors on college campuses um, and also again the constant fight for um, abortion whether it's pro-choice or um, pro-life um, so you know gender equality is really enshrined in every aspect of um, politics whenever we're talking about stuff so um, the ERA is really essential um, in defending 
um, people on both sides, men and women. It's just um, defending people um, based on the, on their sex. Um, and then again, um, gender equality is intersection. There's so much intersection with all the um, topics that we're talking about today: healthcare, environment, gun violence, LGBTQ plus rights. Um, it's really enshrined in all of those different things. Um, and then again, it's just um, the ERA is really just um, granting equal protection for everyone um, from discrimination, regardless of your sex or of your sexual orientation. It's just um, a way for people to be on a more equal footing. So um, regardless of your sex or your sexual orientation, the ERA is something that is going to benefit you. Thank you, Lexi. And then I'm going to direct the same question to Ritwick. And I'll also put in the chat for everyone to um, stay on top of. Yeah, so just to reiterate, um, I'm I'm from Wattcat. Um, so I'm sure that all of us know that the climate crisis is a pressing issue facing humanity today. Um, and some people think that climate um, organizing has taken a back burner due to other social justice issues in the spotlight recently. Um, but Climate as an intersectional issue is only exacerbated by the types of injustices that we're facing at this moment. Um, the coronavirus pandemic has exposed the flaws that exist in our healthcare system for so long. Um, and the frontline communities most affected by the climate crisis um, are the same people who can't afford healthcare are afraid of receiving care due to their undocumented status or don't trust healthcare workers with their bodies um seen in the way that people of color have been used and abused by the healthcare system um and doctors too so those two issues are so intensely connected so medicare for all and a green new deal go hand in hand as progressive policies um, and then even with like Black Lives Matter gaining extensive uh, momentum in the past few weeks, um, racial justice is the key cornerstone of solving climate justice. Um, other resource groups are more exposed to the effects of climate change um, and incompetent governmental systems such as the police. So what I'm trying to get at is that everyone has a stake in the climate crisis. And for most, uh, they have multiple full stakes in the climate crisis. As I mentioned earlier, Black has been trying to, or trying and succeeding at distinguishing itself from the plethora of other climate organizations that exist there. So I think what we do really well is ensuring that intersectionality is the focus of our organizing. Uh, to mobilize as many people as possible for such pressing issues. Um, so in short, people should really care about the climate crisis and YCAP's personal cause as well, um, simply because our work is going to benefit every single person that lives on this planet. Thank you, Ritwick. I'm glad um, your organization is fighting for intersectionality and climate justice. So I'm going to direct the same question, which is why should people care about the cause you are advocating for to Nitty? Yeah, thanks. And it's been um, really great to hear about um, some of the different uh, causes represented on this panel. But I think that in terms of gun violence prevention, um, like obviously just caring about gun violence is important because it is a big structural problem in the United States, um, but also kind of caring about the intersections between different issues. Um, like I'm very passionate about systemic racism. I, at WashU, I do um, research with a couple of professors on um, systemic racism and different um, housing health disparities and different outcome indicators. Um, so that's definitely been my passion, um, but it also has an intersection with um, women's rights. I mean, you can talk about when um, the effects of having a gun and coupling that with um, domestic abuse and when um, a perpetrator has a gun, um, the, the, the chance that 
a victim of domestic abuse is going to be killed and murdered is um, astronomically high. You can talk about the linkage between gun violence prevention and mental health. Um, you can, a lot of um, people who, um, a lot of um, gun violence prevention, we have um, students demand action in one of our priorities has um, a priority called the red flag, red flag laws, which would um, allow uh, close family members um, and friends of a uh, person who may be dangerous to themselves or others um, to temporarily take away a gun um, from uh, said person. So there are a lot of different linkages to different issues that um, are huge problems in the United States. So um, I think that just in general, of course, gun violence is important. Gun violence um, 100 people die every day due to gun violence in the United States, but also linking it to um, systemic racism, mental health issues, women's rights issues, and a lot of other um, systemic problems is um, also very important. Thank you so much. And 100%, like, listening to what these organizations are advocating for, it's so amazing. And especially seeing it um, turn into events. So this brings me to my next question. Um, and I'm going to direct this to Carly, and it is, what's an example of an event you've organized or hosted, and why did you organize this event? I'll also put this question in the chat. Um, hi, yeah, my name is Carly, and I'm, again, I'm with the organization, period. Um, one event that I've hosted along with a few other chapters in Michigan is the National Period Day Rally. Um, in Michigan specifically, we're rallying against the tampon tax, which is the sales tax uh, um, for menstrual hygiene products in Michigan. Um, and the reason why um, we also, this rally was also hosted to raise awareness around the menstrual stigma and to destigmatize um, menstruation in general. Um, and the reason why this is so important, um, as we've heard from all the other panelists, all of these problems are intersectional, and that's why they are so important because they disproportionately affect um, black and brown communities, um, other people of color, women in general. Um, so that's why period poverty is such a big problem because period poverty is something that menstruators can face when they can't afford to buy those sanitary products. And if they can't do that, they might have to resort to um, unsanitary means like using cardboard or, um, or paper towel. And with that comes the risk of infection and other diseases. And when these people are, when the people that are affected by period poverty the most are black and brown menstruators, it makes they are more, since they are more disproportionately affected by them, it impacts them in so many different ways along with some of the other, uh, other problems that we have already talked about in this panel. So yeah, that's just one example of something that I've organized. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to direct the same question to Rachel. Yeah, so um, I'll talk really briefly about two events um, that I've worked on. Um, obviously, inherently in the name of New Jersey Youth Climate Strike, what our organization up until recently was known as, uh, was known as. Um, a lot of the work that we did was planning climate strikes. Um, I think these are really important events for gaining momentum and gaining media attention, um, which is really important for finding and locating more people who will support our cause. Um, most recently, I was involved in organizing um, a strike outside of Congressman Frank Pallone's office. Um, and if you're not from New Jersey, you might not be familiar. Frank Pallone is a Democratic congressman. Um, he also doesn't have a great track record in terms of environmental policy, um, despite being a chairman on an environmental um, committee. Um, he's not a proponent of the Green New Deal, which is one of the large asks that we were demanding. Um, we were also focusing on a lot of pipelines that are being proposed in New Jersey. Um, although we are a democratically run state, we haven't made the best progress in terms of environmental policy. Um, and there's still a long ways we can go, especially with our close proximity to New York um, and also the large amount of pollutants that come out of our state. 
Um, I would say another um, event that I'm really proud of hosting has taken place during quarantine. Um, we had a climate town hall with a whole bunch of progressive political candidates running for Congress across the state of New Jersey. Um, it was really interesting to hear from proponents of the Green New Deal. Um, they really connected with youth volunteers and that mobilized a lot of our membership to get involved in working on their um, campaigns. Um, I know like a big conversation right now in HSCA is the possibilities of endorsements, but when it comes down to it, when it comes down to it, um, the most important thing that we can do is really engage our members um, to get involved on the grassroots level and, ho and help out politicians who are really going to fight for youth issues. Um, so having that space where politicians were directly speaking with youth volunteers in like a close knit setting was really empowering. Um, and like everyone's already detailed, you know, these issues are extremely intersectional. There are a lot of crossovers between all of our issues. Um, so it was really important to have our leaders talk to us, um, not only about the climate crisis, but about all related issues. Thank you, Rachel. And we are going to ask the same question to um, Emma. And again, the question is, what's an example of an event you've organized or hosted? And why did you organize this event? Yeah, so um, an event that I was able to host just recently about the first or second week of June, um, which was a really profound and significant experience was um, a meeting to kind of discuss um, where as a movement we stand with the Black Lives Matter community and with racial inequality because without racial justice, there is no climate justice. And I think it's really important that, you know, we are seeing out our own goals as a climate movement, but that we're here to support, aid, and serve the Black community right now because all of the issues that they're fighting for, we're fighting for. And there's so much intersectionality and common ground between the two movements that it's that it's imperative that we serve them right now. Um, and I was able to host a meeting where essentially we talked about um, the difference between physical and virtual actions and how we can get involved, whether it be with phone banking for um, candidates that support not only the Green New Deal, but um, police abolition, um, and also talking about bills that we support slash acts that are, you know, coming into the White House right now and that we want to support and promote um, or whether it be protesting physically and safely. Um, and it was a really great experience to be able to not only have that, but also have a space for BIPOC folks to talk about the racism that they've experienced um, their entire lives, as well as the privilege that they've been able to recognize throughout all of this. Because I know for myself, I am Middle Eastern, but I have you know, been able to really recognize the privilege that I harbor and that I am able to use to amplify the voices of the Black community right now. Um, and from there, we were able to really realize how we are able to serve the Black community right now. And I think that that was just a great experience overall and something that we will be, you know, prioritizing moving forward for sure. Thank you so much. And I think through these events, we really see uh, whether it's, you know, protesting, collecting donations, or lobbying outside of a establishment politician's office, um, we see things going forward and change happening. Um, so this is going to bring me to my next question, and I'm going to direct it to Emma again. And how would it, someone get involved in organizing and being a part of an activist organization? And I'll also type this question into the chat. Yeah, so... For Sunrise, the Sunrise movement in general makes it really easy for people to get fully involved in the organization because I know for some activism movements, it seems kind of hard to, you know, navigate all of the pillars of leadership and how to really get involved and really be at the forefront of the fight. But with Sunrise, it makes it really simple and really seamless to be able to do so. So as it's as easy as visiting our website and, you know, either filling out an application for a national position um, or joining um, a hub near you in your state. Um, and then from there, it's really easy to get involved. So for example, with Sunrise LA Youth, um, we changed the structure of our leadership network so that instead of having lead roles, we would have team leads um, so that we can allow as many people as possible to really be heavily involved with the organization process of our actions and of our events. 
Um, so taking away that sense of hierarchy, because that's really something that we've tried to abolish and get rid of as a movement as a whole, and just being able to even the general hub members allow them to really be able to propose different actions, propose different events that they themselves are able to organize and the stigma behind, you know, um, overstepping essentially in a, in a place or a space that's led heavily by the leadership and it's run by the leadership. Instead of having that, we really open up the space for people to be able to lead and fight the fight at the forefront. Thank you, Emma, because I know it's like, you know, all of us are so passionate about um, issues and we care about them. So it's always difficult to kind of like navigate how to like start your activism. So I'm going to ask this, the same question to um, Lexi. Yeah, so um, I can talk about this a little like in more of a general sense and then specifically within Generation Ratify. Um, so specifically just in terms of if anyone's interested in getting involved in an activist organization, I'd say the biggest thing to like start looking is through social media. So a lot of times organizations will post um, like where applications are open for these types of positions. Um, and then like specifically you would follow um, chapters or state chapters that are in your local area. Um, because I know like specifically for New Jersey Generation Ratify, um, we're currently looking for an outreach director so like we posted that on our Instagram so that people would be able to see and then there's like a link in our bio to like go directly to the application um, so like Instagram Facebook Twitter all those types of things people like are really vocal about like wanting new people and getting more um, types of people involved in their organization um, and then um, specifically within Generation Ratify, um, going onto our website is always um, a valid option. And I think there are actually some national positions um, opening right um, that are in the process of being filled right now. I want to say applications close um, either in like the next week or in like the next two weeks. So if anyone's interested in getting involved in Generation Ratify, um, that is definitely open to you. But I think overall just like making sure you're doing research um, and staying on top of any opportunities that um, you see coming is the biggest way to get involved um, in the activist organization of your choice. Thank you Lexi for telling us how to get um, involved in Generation Ratify. So I'm going to ask the same question and I'll repeat the question. How would someone get involved in organizing and being a part of an activist organization to Rachel? Yeah, so I'm sorry, it's kind of loud outside, but I'll speak in a more general sense. Um, I think like the most important piece of advice that I could give is not being afraid to do the work. Um, like when I first got involved with climate organizing, as I said, I was 14 years old and I was put in charge of organizing our strike permit. Um, I think like a lot of people can assume that 14 year olds don't know a lot about how to get a permit or like any sort of legal um, document in that sense. Um, but like that project was kind of like the first thing that I did in terms of genuine grassroots organizing. Um, and like that is super valuable experience because even if you do like move up the ranks into like a higher position, um, which honestly like in grassroots organizing, like positions don't mean anything if you're just doing the work and really getting involved. Um, but like having that experience of doing like the logistics work on the ground was super important because like then from there, um, once I had like that credibility of finishing a task and knowing how to do it, then I was able to move into media and organizing like media for the events. And then from there, I was really able to find myself in a position where I was doing the work that interested me. Um, and I would also say like something that I think every um, person should just take as um, a tip is like always know when to kind of step back. Um, I think like I definitely messed up in this realm before, um, but like a lot of the things that we've been focusing on in this panel um, is the intersectionality of these issues. So like letting the people who are at the forefront of these issues take the way and speak um, is really important. And I can definitely say like, hold me accountable. Um, I've messed up in this realm before. Um, no organizer's perfect. Um, but it's really important to let the people who are affected by these issues speak. Um, and that's a really key part of attaining credibility and organizing and really getting involved, learning about what your issue is and how you can actually represent it going forward. Thank you, Rachel, and all those who answered the question. I think in these organizations, there's a role for everyone. 
Um, so that brings me asking our next question, and that is how do you suggest advocating um, your cause to already elected officials? And then this question is going to be for everyone. Um, I guess I will um, assign a specific person so like we don't have, um, so Nitty, do you want to answer this first? Yeah, sure. Um, and I think that there are a couple of ways and I'm going to not just speak to my experience in the gun violence prevention realm, but also just in general. Um, so I think that one of the ways there are two flanks, you can either work with elected officials and kind of um, advocate for like tone down your message and make it sound more moderate and bipartisan. Um, you can do that and kind of like uh, take the less adversarial uh, approach. And I do that a lot. Um, I intern with the ACLU currently, um, and I intern with St. I'm currently in St. Louis, but um, I intern with the Chamber of Commerce as well. So we do a lot of that in organizations. But on the other hand, I mean, as an activist, you can take to the streets and protest and uh, take the more adversarial um, lens. And I've also done that these past um, couple of weeks. I don't know if you guys saw the the image of the the two the couple with like pointing guns at um, protesters in St. Louis, but I was there. Um, I think that was two days ago. Um, but then also, I mean, that wasn't like St. Louis has some violent protests. But um, I was also like, I know that Ferguson has made the news a lot. Um, but in Florissant, um, like what's currently going on is that the police department um, is macing us and arresting protesters. So, I mean, I've been involved with those protests too, and they have been very effective. Just yesterday, um, they announced that they were going to close one of the jails um, that was basically like a poverty jail um, in St. Louis. So I can see both ways. And I honestly think that um, the activism route is a little bit more effective um, because it puts like continue, more continued pressure um, and strives for more radical demands. But I think that it's going to depend on which kind of like, whether you're kind of like more of like a civility organization or whether you want to be known as like more of like a radical protester, um, but both are valid. Thank you so much. Activism leads to change. I think that's so essential to like know and like keep people motivated. Um, but we're going to ask the same question to how about Carly? Yeah, so recently um, me and some of the people in my chapter have been part of this policy boot camp. Um, and since we've been doing it in quarantine, we've, we've really focused our work to how to do it in quarantine since a lot of the times um, if you're not if you don't feel safe enough to go outside and protest or even just meet up with people because of um, various health issues or other other reasons. Um, one way to reach out to um, to impact change is really just starting at your local level. Um, with me personally for the tampon tax, just reach out to your state representative, um, the person who is literally supposed to be voicing your concerns in the state government, and then working your way up and through through all of the other elected officials in your state government. Um, we've been having we've been having meetings with um, virtual meetings with some of these state representatives, getting ideas from them for those who support um, the movement that we are trying to bring. They are give, they can give us tips on how to help, um, and then eventually trying to work our way through the representatives that are currently not supporting us and convincing them to support our cause. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. From the local, state, and national level, there's so many um, people, I guess, who are, um, that should be at least advocating for you. Um, but we'll ask the same question to um, Lexi. Yeah, so um, very similar to Carly, um, Generation Radify has been doing a lot um, to meet with elected representatives. So specifically within New Jersey, um, we had the chance to speak to um, staffers um, of both of our senators um, who are both Democrats. Um, so it was a little bit easier. Um, and basically I would say some advice is just like making sure obviously that you're prepared, but like having a specific hard ask. So um, for us, um, 
New Jersey has already ratified the ERA. Um, so we didn't really need to ask our senators to like vote for the ERA. We just needed them um, to fight for the passage of the ERA and like convince their other members um, from more red states um, to consider um, voting for the ERA. Um, and then another thing is just like amplifying on social media and making sure that they're um, vo vocally um, advocating for the ERA. Um, so within a blue state, it's pretty easy. And then within red states, it's a little bit more difficult because you kind of have to like craft the story of your organization to kind of appeal to that politician and what they're looking for and wanting to um, advance in their agenda. Um, so like specifically with Generation Ratify um, and passing the ERA, um, talking to um, Republican politicians about um protecting all genders from discrimination and like having equal pay um and then with blue states you can talk a little bit more about um fighting for abortion rights and um those types of things that are a little more decisive um but i think the biggest thing um is just holding your officials accountable um meeting with them having town halls that type of thing um so that they can just like see the sheer magnitude of people who are interested in that topic so that they are aware that their constituents are fighting for that issue thank you so much lexi and i'm sorry to the rest of the panelists i don't think we have time to um ask the question to everyone um do you rachel sorry <laughs> We have time for like two more. We have to wrap up at 2.50. Oh, okay, great. Um, yes, next up, Ritwick, do you want to answer this question? Yeah, so with climate activism, it's a bit hard to like push already elected officials to pass effective climate legislation or change their views on like the more progressive side of what we want to solve the climate crisis. So like usually the commonly held belief for climate activism is to get rid of incompetent leaders and get out the youth vote to elect um, progressives to local, state, and federal office. Um, but there are still really good ways to pressure officials that are already elected. Um, one way is, um, I know Sunrise does this, but one way is to get them to sign the No Fossil Fuel Money Pledge, um, which means that they will not take any donations from fossil fuel companies or executives while in office or while running for re-election. Um, and also, like Lexi said, holding town hall meetings with already elected progressives um, is going to pressure other politicians to seek out the youth vote by supporting those issues. Um, and YCAT is more of like a leftist organization, I would say. So uh, like Nidhi said, like, you know, do you want to like, you know, portray yourself as like this radical activist or someone that's going to work with politicians? Um, so depending on what your cause is and how you want to portray yourself, um, I would say that you could either work with your elected politicians or take to the streets and um, be like a radical activist. Yeah, absolutely. And I think with the time remaining, we can fit both of our um, last two speakers. So Emma, you can, I guess, answer this question. Yeah, definitely. And I think I'm going to kind of piggyback off of some of my other panelists really quickly to kind of get to my point, but you know, we've mentioned town halls and meeting with your um, either local or state um, politicians and leaders. And if your you know local congressman or politician isn't open to holding town halls, that's a problem because that's something that they're pretty much obligated to have with the people. And Oftentimes we find that some are more open to meeting with people than others. Like I know with my Congressman Adam Schiff, he's far more open to meeting with people to discuss and table and talk about certain issues, especially climate change. Um, but for example, with California Senator Dianne Feinstein, she's a major opponent of the Green New Deal and essentially does not want to hear anything about climate change as a whole. She, she doesn't want to discuss or hear from any of the youth voices or adult voices in general. And I think in cases like that, it's really important to bombard politicians and be persistent. And obviously stay level-headed, um, you know, open with facts, everything like that. Just make sure that everything is on a professional basis, but really be persistent and bombard them because that, that has been really effective and is really effective. And whether that be um, 
sitting in at their offices or um, doing Twitter storms or calling their offices or emailing. There are so many ways to just get the get the message out there and make politicians see, you know, this is what we're fighting for and this is an important issue. And also, I think it's important to um, approach all of these social justice issues on a nonpartisan I guess level because you know it's easy to um, connect um, the climate movement with you know leftist politics and I think Sunrise is definitely a more leftist movement but I think even with for example in Bakersfield and Fresno where there are more of um, Republican areas that are disproportionately affected by unsustainable agricultural methods and tactics it's really important to just approach the situations with different politicians and elected officials um, as level-headed as possible and you know showing that this is an issue that affects all of us and it's really not a two-partisan issue so definitely just making sure that you're staying level-headed obviously but being persistent is very important to making politicians and elected officials see that our issues are important and that we want justice for them. Absolutely, 100%. And I think we can finish off um, our last question with Rachel Gervich. Yeah, I'm gonna make my answer as quick as possible. Um, I think like all of the panelists really summarized this super well. Um, but I would say, um, regardless of what route you're taking, whether that be a more radical route or you're kind of moderating yourself to speak with politicians, always be educated about what you're speaking on. Um, I think like the best feeling is like when you're talking to a politician and then like you pull out like a fact or a bill that they expect you not to know about. And it's like, yeah, I've been paying attention to your track record. Like we know what you're doing. We know that it's not good for us. Um, like I have this one memory. I was at like a democratic fundraising dinner um, and I was talking to my assemblywoman. Um, and like, you know, usually it's kind of like the dumbed down conversation, but when you come in there like with facts and it shows that you know what you're talking about, they'll treat you as an equal and then hopefully retain more of the demands that you were, um, that you're talking about. Um, so yeah, I'd say if you're going to advocate on an issue, constantly educate yourself on that. We've seen that a lot with the Black Lives Matter movement, like consistently holding yourself accountable, educating yourself more. Um, but I want to be respectful of people's time. So quick synopsis. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I see my, Milo here as well. But just a big thank you to all, all of our panelists, all of our attendees. We appreciate it greatly. We hope this was very um, informative and you can obviously carry this out um, where you are. So right now, I just want all the panelists, if they are willing to, type their contact information in the um, chat. Of course, if you're willing to, um, because I know a lot of um, people were messaging me personally to ask questions. So that's definitely an opportunity if you have more questions or um, comments to ask the panelists as well. Yeah, and I think we're all dropping our organizations as well. Um, so if you have any questions about how to get involved with those, please, please reach out. Okay, and I don't think I have the power to end the meeting because I'm not the host, but just another big thank you. And I think either Milo or um, Nina, I think you can end the call.